Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am pleased that you're here. I want to be respectful to the people who show up on time so, so that we can uh, get, get the uh, webinar started. My name is Larry Raff. I am president of Copley Raff, a national uh, fundraising consulting firm, and the creator of Abacus Major Donor Ask Calculator, which is the sponsor of these, this webinar series. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the esteemed David Garamella. Uh, Dave is the founder and CEO of the Giving Collaborative, a global uh, fundraising and management consulting firm. Uh, Dave and I have been uh, colleagues and friends for, for many years, and I'm thrilled that he's, uh, one, agreed to participate in this, and two, is my very first firm to subscribe to uh, Abacus. And uh, so uh, it's a double it's a double goodie for me. And uh, let's begin if we can. This is going to be thirty minutes of a back and forth on addressing how to build your your donor pipeline and feed your major donor program. So, Dave. Well, first thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And uh, I love that we're at the genesis of uh, of Abacus, and we have some of our our partners already using it. So we're excited about it. And no, I thought it was a great opportunity. And uh, I love to talk about donor pipeline. It's uh, we need it's it. It's where the action is, right? And that's it. So um, let's go. I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. Let's go. Well, so pipeline, who who makes the pipeline? What are the criteria that you use to actually qualify a donor to be in the pipeline? Sure. There, they, I mean, you know, the, you could look at, I think the first thing is that Heck, you can you can find pipeline anywhere. So don't don't not look everywhere in whether you're at the supermarket or in your office. But if you need to be kind of uh, from a business perspective, I like to uh, when I look at pipeline, especially to move them into major gifts. I want to look at total giving to the organization. I look at you know has there been a progression from that $25 annual gift, are they now at a president's circle at $1,000, at $500? I like to look at that. Uh, you know, don't count out your uh, your network, right? Whether it's board members, other colleagues within the organization, no matter what your sector is, hospital, higher ed, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, kind of press on them and lean on your friends for referrals. Other donors, you know, all those asking um, kind of, light bulbs that go out, always be listening for that. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we, we overlook this one and, and maybe it's, it sometimes doesn't feel totally kind, but it's the, the way it works is if, you know, you have somebody that's in your organization at maybe a smaller level, but you see that they give kind of a, a principal or a major gift to another organization in your community, in your town, in the same sector, well, maybe there's a bigger um, desire to help philanthropically, so don't throw that out as well. All, all important criteria, and I'm, I also am one not to uh, overlook uh, like organizations if they publish their top donor tiers uh, to definitely get them at least on the screening list uh, for your pipeline and see if anybody knows them because they're pretty qualified. That's it. And you know, you're never going to, you know, you don't twist somebody's arm to become a major donor at your organization. There has to be an affinity, but at least uh, give them an opportunity to opt out. Don't you opt them out on your own. Yeah. As, as, as you and I both know, uh, in campaigns, there are always surprises Absolutely. and there are real wonderful surprises and disappointments, but there are always surprises. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's let's talk about using that pipeline, you know, in a campaign, in portfolio. Uh, how do you determine which gift officer, which director development VP gets which people from the pipeline into their portfolios? How do you triage that? One, how do you how does someone qualify to be in a portfolio? And then how do you triage them out? Okay, so if if they've quali been qualified for whatever reason, they're, through wealth screening, through a tool like Abacus, through if you're using one of the the vendors out there that do you know kind of that the broad based screenings, if they've been giving on a regular basis, that's great. All right, so it's kind of like a 
we call it a, a four right rule, but um, if trying to figure out, you know, who's the best gift officer or is it not a gift officer? Is it somebody from the board? Is it a combination board and a C-suite person? Um, and, and you can match it up by kind of backgrounds. They went to the same school. They, they have the same hobbies. Uh, you know, sometimes gender, age plays into it. Uh, you know, I know, you know, when I was a, a major gift officer, guys, I'm dating myself this is 25 years ago, but I was at Rhode Island hospital. I knew my sweet spot was, were, were donors somewhere between like 65 and 75 for whatever reason, that was the, the place I could be when I was talking to kind of my peers, you know, I fell short on goals, right? For whatever reason, it just didn't work. So, you know, looking at, at that age, gender, uh, you know, I, you may, I don't know where you, you, you land on this, but I also think you have to look at size of portfolio, right? You can't just give somebody to a, a, a gift officer because sometimes they never get to them. Right. And that's, the, to me, one of the worst things that can happen. Right. We call somebody out of the annual fund or, you know, kind of direct mail or, or e-solicitation. And then they're they're put into a portfolio. And oh, by the way, it's the end of the fiscal year, end of the calendar year. And nobody's talked to them because we're too busy. Right. So, uh, you know, whatever the, the comfort level it is, whether it's a 75 person portfolio or a 300 person portfolio, we can. That's a whole other discussion. But. Do you really have room and can you see that person? And that, that's a, you've touched on a really hot topic, size of portfolios. And I'm sure you're aware that Virginia Mason did a whole study on that. And, and, and they arrived at the, uh, the number of 25 in a portfolio, which no one can really get their head around, at least in, in the East. <laughs> but, no, no. But, but to do more than 50 and to expect any kind of relationship to be created in that number is is it's brilliant is. right it, it, you know it, the smaller the portfolio the more productive they're going to be your gift officers are going to be and they're going to spend more time getting to the gift right as opposed to getting called into qualifying and you know kind of chasing people down just because they're they're oh yeah we think that person is worth X amount of dollars. I mean, you run into the challenge of budgets, right? And how many gift officers could the shop bring on? And those are all other issues. But I'm I'm with you. The the, the smaller the the portfolio, the better. So the, here's another caveat question that often comes up. Do you do discovery visits if if no one really knows the donor and and we they're in the pipeline, but we're not sure if they should be in a portfolio yet. The, does does the discovery visit happen before the donor gets assigned into a portfolio, uh, or is, does the assignment get made into a portfolio with the expectation that the gift officer will have that discovery visit, uh, uh, really get to know one another a little bit, uh, and then make that decision whether to remain in the portfolio or not? Wow. No, that's so I, I'm going to kind of lean on size of shop. And if you have the the ability to whether have a consultant or have kind of a, a, a mid-level gift officer qualify, as, you, I don't want to take my frontline fundraisers out of the field. Right. I want that. Absolutely. I want them to qualify if it's if it's somebody that you think is really has priority or propensity to kind of make that that larger major gift. But if it's maybe we don't really know, I would rather have it go to to, to someone else and then kind of treat to your using your your words there, triage it to the appropriate gift officer. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I think we have to do a better job of working with our teams of teaching our gift officers how to qualify, right? What are the appropriate questions to ask? You know, sometimes we become perpetual cultivators and we just talk about, oh, you know, I saw your kids at the soccer game or did you enjoy the concert? Instead of getting into, you know, where where are you philanthropically? What gets you excited? What, what's going to drive you? And those are the, the things you need to be asking uh, I think when you're when you're qualifying a, a prospect, I couldn't agree with you more. We spend so much emphasis on the end of the end of the uh, process, the ask, right, right, where the discovery is where you really learn the information you need 
to be successful on the other end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, there's, I'm going to ask you a question that's not on here right now, but it, a lot of the processes have a, a percentage likelihood of success, a percentage sure. that are assigned. I, I know, uh, you know, Razor's Edge certainly uses that methodology. Others do too. And, you know, one of my clients, I posed to them, so is it, if it's 80%, does that mean you're going to get 80% of what you asked for? Or there's an 80% chance you'll get a gift, right? Or there's an 80% chance I'm going to get to the point of even asking for a gift. Right. How, how do you explain those or use those in your practice? Do you, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to put it back on you a little bit. So one of the things that I like to press on, on our partners is con, kind of conversion, right? When we the, the, That's kind of the first thing that we're going to look at and say, all right, you've been, you know, you have a portfolio of X and, you know, you've targeted Larry for a thousand and David for 500. What's, what has been the conversion at that? Is it 25% of your, your portfolio hitting that? And then I kind of work backwards there. Uh, it, it's not happening enough, frankly. I'm not, I'm probably not doing a pressing on my clients enough to say, uh, come on, let's, what, you know, why aren't we closing at a higher rate? Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's so many variables right it's uh no i like it i like the i like the question and, and it's good to think about where, where, where are you going with your practice on that well i, I i'm going to uh not using it <laughs> all right all right that's fair I, I, at all because if the other processes are in place then we should have a pretty good idea of who's going to be asked by some date right and and if we're going to be asking them, okay, and they're going to be ready to be asked, right? And we're going to be ready. So the likelihood of a gift is high. The likelihood of being asked is high, mm -hmm. and it's just a question really of of how much at the end of the day. That's where advocates comes in, frankly, well, right? Helping right. determine that sort of thing. And, and that's it. You know, I think as consultants, we have a good sense of you know when we look at a portfolio and we're in a campaign you know, just kind of based on experience outside of that one shop, we could we could kind of massage and get close to what the ask should be, right? But to have, and, and this is where I got excited about Abacus and not to put up a, you know, a 30 second promo spot, but that's why I think it's an exciting thing to talk about here is that any extra tools we have outside of, you know, traditional wealth screening saying, oh, there's a capacity of somewhere between 25,000 and a million. Well, heck, that's a, you know, that's a Grand Canyon, right? Where, where am I going to land? So these, this, this kind of a tool is, is helpful on that. And, um, and so I, that's why I'm excited and why I'm doing this. And I'm thrilled about it. Uh, and, this, and that leads to an, an additional question. Okay. And we're talking about valuing, you know, the percentage, are you valuing okay. the ask or the result or what have you? How do you actually assign a, a valuation of how much to expect from someone's portfolio, it, it, if if they do all the asks that they anticipate doing, mm -hmm. how much you expect the result will be total for that period of time for that portfolio? How do you? Sure. What tools do you use to to value it so that management has an expectation of revenue based on the pipeline? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at their kind of lifetime giving. That's all, you know, that's something I absolutely want to look at. I want to look at their involvement with the organization. Are they a board member? Do they attend galas? Do they, were they in the feasibility study for the last campaign? Uh, you know, it's all kind of qualitative and quantitative, right? We're looking at both of that. Uh, and, and then we'll look at screening. You know, that's kind of where it comes. And then it comes from kind of our own experiences and in, in the in this spe specific ask with this specific person. But there's no kind of there's not a technology piece that I have that says, OK, the ask should be a thousand dollars. It's it's all these kind of other pieces put together and then we put it out there. Well, now you have a technology I thing to use. <laughs> I <laughs> know, advocates. I know, so we I looked know. at all those things. Uh, you, you talked about screening. Uh, how important is screening pipeline, portfolio, and sure. anticipation of gifts in the whole 
you know, oh. all right, to, to, to my friends at, at our screeners out there, I value what they bring to the table and you need to do it. I just, you know, I, I, I caution prospects or prospects, I caution clients. You, you kind of have to take it almost now with a grain of salt, right? Really sophisticated donors know how to move things around there. You know, how many times have we done a, a profile on someone through a screening service? And we know there's capacity. We know the companies that they own. We know where they live. We know what they give to other organizations. And they, they come back not as a prospect of wealth or, you know, not even on the, the radar. So yeah. you kind of have to take it with that. But I think it's a great tool and it's an important tool because it's, it's, uh, it's another piece, right? And, and no, is anything perfect? Absolutely not. But I think you want to have some sort of a screening. Uh, you, you get your money back right away. If you do one screening a year, you're going to get that money back. Uh, it's a good investment, even with yeah. taking with a grain of salt. Uh, agreed. Uh, and I'm going to invite our audience, if you have any questions, please, please. use the chat for that. Um, we're wide open to it. And while you're thinking about your fantastic questions, I'm going to ask Dave about how do you refresh? So when my port, when I've, when I've closed five gifts and I've had a portfolio of 40 and now I have a portfolio of 35, where do those five more come from? And how do they get stacked up or queued up to enter a portfolio from the pipeline? Well, it's, it all depends on what your what mechanisms you're using to qualify people as a, a major prospect. Are you doing is somebody coming in? Are you screening everybody that that makes an annual fund gift? Are you screening pay? You know, if you're in a hospital, you know, kind of grateful patients to a specific position. Are you screening? Uh, alums on a regular basis or, or, or end users uh, and, and how does that pipeline um, how do you create that pipeline that way and that that's so I everybody's going to get an alert on their cell phone right now from the federal government so that's what this is they're testing um, and there's not much I could do about it so I apologize did you get it Larry you didn't get it are they consulting the fundraising consulting network system they are they are <laughs> everyone should make a campaign gift to their favorite charity right now <laughs> uh, so uh so that's you know that's kind of how I, I you're in Florida right now by the way and that that's you you know they get all kinds of alerts in Florida we have no there's nothing wrong in Florida we no we hurricanes there's no hurricanes oh there it is there it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw it on the news this morning. There is a question in the um, in the chat about boards and how to uh, best use your board to grow pipeline. Uh, that that is that that is the 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 magic garden of all prospect qualification, right? Is your board? Uh, you need to be as a gift. I don't know what your role is if if you're the chief development officer, major gift officer, but if you have access to your board. Uh, you need to be working with them in lockstep as close as possible. They need to trust you and you need to trust them and you need to be sitting with them. They are your best advocates to create pipeline and give you, um, give you access to opportunities. Here's the, here's the caveat. I don't know if it's caveat or um, kind of a cautionary tale. It's great when board members give us names and it's really hard to get them to do that. But what really makes it effective is when that board member is with you and brings the introduction into play. That's the ultimate qualifier, right? So get that board member to not only give you names, but also do the introduction. You can take it from there if that's the way it's going to be. But um, but that that's how you win when the board member does. At least I, I that's my... I'm super happy when I hear that that's going on at a client. So true. And, you know, physicians are probably sort of the second kind of group yeah, yeah. that Absolutely. are really valuable. And and program senior staff people tend to know a lot of a lot of people who have used services, who have wealth, and they have that that relationship, uh, which which is, let's face it, as you said, basically, it's a relationship business and and major gifts is all about that absolutely even though more and more fundraising is staff driven i know 
I know. I, uh, I, you know, I just was having that conversation yesterday. I have, uh, you know, if you have one or two board members or volunteers that are willing to go with you on that adventure, you win, right? That's true. So true. If you even have a campaign cabinet of uh, volunteers, yeah, that's, uh, that's you, you win. <laughs> I think something else went into the chat. Yes, where... I'm looking right now. Uh, so from uh, John uh, Cunin. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, the the quality of my life improved and stress levels went down when I gave up counting on <laughs> boards for assistance in major gift fundraising. Great when it happens, but cheers. Well said. That. That's perfect. That so, is. So okay. So the alternative to that, or the the adjunct to that, is a is a development committee of people who are not board members. Right. If you can assemble those or campaign committee, or the board of advisors that a lot of organizations have, a board of associates. Are you are you seeing any campaign, this is off topic a little bit, but are you seeing any of your campaigns not even, I, I get the cabinet, right? We have that, but we actually now have a couple of campaigns going on where they've decided not to have a chair. They, they've, and I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm not. That's not where I'm going with that. But I didn't know if anybody else has seen that. Uh, we uh, we tend to use a co-chair model, and yep. everyone and everyone in my world have been using the co-chair model because to 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 attract a chair is very difficult because they don't think anyone has their back. Whereas if you've got a co-chair model, then right. Then you can I love that. Them. We have we have another question. Thank you, Greg. Um, board members uh, refer friends when the value they have received from giving and participating is so amazing, and they have friends with the same motivational drivers, thanks to their life story intersection with the cause. Wow. Well, well, well said and profound. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's really good. Yes, thank you for that. I'm going to use that. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> and and you know, but and don't ever oh, and don't ever um, underestimate. And I'll, and I'll say it again. Um, the donor who has been a loyal donor hasn't risen to the identification of being a major major donor had never been asked that if you just ask they could be waiting for you to ask and they may value be valued low on your in your pipeline and so my my point in saying this is don't take don't use some formula and just rule a whole group of people out Absolutely. as oh they're not they're not ever going to be right not true Absolutely. Have you seen that? Oh, sure. Oh, no, they're not going to support us. They don't like us. They don't like the color of our uniforms. They don't like the new building. They don't. Everybody self-selects as opposed to not everyone, but that happens more often than not, even in the best shops. Right. So this is mm -hmm. uh, this is across the board, something to really pay attention to. I saw something else come up, but I'm not getting the. Oh, there it is. Oh, there you go. Many board members, friends don't have that same intersection and without it, they won't make referral. Yeah. You know, what I have found too is they, the board, the volunteers and staff have to trust the development shop. They have to trust physicians. They have to trust that you've got their back, that you won't embarrass them, but they're giving you their, 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 their capital, their social capital. And they don't want you to screw it up. And if they don't trust the shop, that spigot is going to get shut off and the referrals aren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. So look look internally for your own, how, how others see your shop as a measure of how well you'll do by recruiting people. There was a, a question that came up about if you're in a s small shop, uh, you know, sometimes you got to create that pipeline from scratch, 
right? Maybe you're getting government funding or, or city funding, state funding, wherever you are, or one angel investor. So how do you kind of switch gears? Uh, you, you know, I think it's gonna it's gonna depend on where you are and what type of organization. If it's social service, whether it's a school, a hospital, it doesn't matter. But you're gonna have to. It's gonna be holistic. It's got to be kind of grassroots. It's it's about your board. It's about kind of those that are qualified as friends of the organization. And you start that. You know, kind of at that really kind of simple baseline level. To to Larry's point about. Um, portfolios and the smaller, the better. Uh, you know, I, I, I always try to challenge our, our partners when we're in a campaign, you know, I want your, your hierarchy of top 50 to hundred donors, right? Let's figure out those folks first. And then, yeah, at the same time in parallel, uh, we could run a, a, you know, here's my top 300 that I want to have happen. So that's kind of what I would ask you to do, right? I would like really sit down and just start writing. And oh, Larry and David and Sue and Maggie. And you know, you just kind of go from there. And that's that's the organic. And frankly, it's probably the best way because you're going to really put people down that have a passion. You're not going to necessarily say, say, oh, well, let's put Warren Buffett down or Bill Gates or, you know, kind of the usual suspects of you know, anybody with a billion dollar portfolio, although somebody new may have one after Powerball tonight. So I don't know, maybe I'll be one of those donors. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but and have to, to the original question and have a cause celeb, have a case for support, Correct. have a have a reason to be point. reaching out yep. to people. That's exciting. And you can talk Absolutely. about, it, you know, Absolutely. so I'm going to ask you that, that, that sort of the, my final question. Can you begin or undertake a campaign without a major donor pipeline? Well, so there's two parts to that question. Sure, you can do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be successful. <laughs> well, that, that's the real question, right? And and I think every, listen, there's no better way to kind of raise sites and raise the, the importance of philanthropy than a campaign, right? It gets everybody excited, but you got to do your homework before you get into that. So you need to have some sort of a portfolio, right? You know, it, it usually it, it's sometimes like a, a rule of thirds, right? If you want to raise a, a million dollars and you know to get there, you're going to need X amount of prospects. You probably need three times as many to get there. So you better be figuring out what the heck that portfolio is going to look like. So yeah, can you run a campaign without a, you know, a, a major gift pipeline? Sure. Uh, you're not going to get very far or you're going to get through that initial phase and then you're going to be, it's going to be slog, uh, you, you know, slogville and, and boards are going to get annoyed and CEOs are going to get annoyed. And um, it's just not, it's not the way to do it. Uh, it we've all heard of stories where some, where some organization has started from scratch and raised $40 million, but sure. those, those, that's fairy dust. And, and, and and flipping coin heads a hundred times in a row. It it, it could happen, but it, it, don't count on it in your in your shop. Um, it, it's been half an hour. I'm going to ask everyone to think for more, about more questions, and I'm going to take a personal privilege and do a brief uh, uh, um, explanation of what this abacus thing is that you I've been talking about, and. It, I'm going to begin with all of us knowing that uh, when we're getting ready to do to ask a donor for a major gift, uh, we get all this donor research together from friends, you know, street research and from uh, wealth assessment and and the web searches. And but we still have to come up with a number. We still have to number, a number to ask for, and it's really a guessing game, and it's affected by our personal biases. The capacity assessments, as, as David was talking about, uh, sometimes leave enough something to be desired. And when will I have enough information? Analysis paralysis uh, can often happen. Gee, maybe something will come up I didn't know about yet. So uh, for some reason, there we go. So what Abacus does is it provides a readiness score for you. So you know if you have enough of the right information for the, for the ask. And it gives you a recommended ask amount and a pledge goal, meaning asking 39 or $40,000, you round it 
to get 30. And what's really, really heartening for us is that so far, real world experience with pledges that we've received while using Abacus uh, Calculator, we are within 2% of actual pledges when you look at the pledge goal amounts, within 2%. So our accuracy seems to be shining through. This hall was created. I worked with over 400 advancement officers over 10 years, um, perfecting the algorithm behind it. And it's taken me a long time to do it. And one other use for this that I know Dave is going to be using and his people are going to be using is to value portfolios and value pipelines. Because when you do 50 or 100 profiles and you add up through your export, uh, all the goals, that's going to give you a pretty accurate measure of what the value of that pipeline or that portfolio is. So uh, please do visit uh, donoradvocates.com. You can try it for free for seven days, unlimited use for seven days. So please take it for a spin and see if you like it. Thank you for your indulgence on that. What else has come in in the meantime, Dave? Let's see. Carmen, I'm wondering how best to use our board to grow our major donor pipeline besides asking them to look into their Rolodex for potential prospects and asking them to invite prospects or who they think may be potential for major gift to events. How else do you use the board? Do you assign board members a contact, a few prospects, meaning give a board member their own portfolio? Or how do you, how do you work with them? I, well, I work with, I'll, I like boards to be assigned if they're, if they're willing, right? Like if we have a board member that's all in and I want to help out with this, absolutely. I want them comfortable uh, with their portfolio if that's what they want to be, right? But I don't expect my board members necessarily to be solicitors, right? I want to vet them. I want to qualify them just as much. I want to see if they want to be a, a connector and help us figure out who the heck is... Uh, who else is a, a qualified prospect to the organization? So I really want to talk to them that way. Uh, and I want to get them to feel comfortable with whatever their role is. But heck, if they're, they're someone who's willing to kind of be there with me, make the ask, uh, tell the story uh, face to face, that that's amazing. Uh, but I also don't want to overburden them, right? So, uh, you know, two to three prospects at a time is probably more than enough, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, you, maybe you'll get a more ambitious board member, but I think that's probably, that's where you want to land. You know, the, the, the specter of, an, of inviting people to an event uh, is part sure. of that question. And, you know, it's an easier ask for a board member to say, come sit at my table right. at, at the event that I bought. You know, that's, it's, you don't have, you're not asking for money, you're just asking for an evening of their time. Uh, right. And that's, uh, most board members are pretty willing to, to take a stretch on that. Absolutely. If you're in a campaign, you know, ask if all your board members, you know, over the course of the campaign, if you can figure out like one a month, uh, depending on where you live, what you could call this, but coming from Connecticut, I don't know why I always call them parlor events. You can call them porch events. You can call them patio events. You can call them anything you want, but uh, you know, to, to Larry's point about events, but maybe they could do something in their home. They could, if they're a part of a club, uh, you know, invite three or four couples over. You could tell the story, why your organization is amazing, why it's deserving of philanthropic support uh, and, and leave it at that. There's not an ask that's going to be there. It's a soft ask, right? We, you're mm -hmm. telling the story, but, uh, and then the gift officer team can, uh, can figure out the follow-up from there. It's an important point. And, you know, one way to warm up board members to do that is <clears throat> an exercise you can do, excuse me, <clears throat> is go around the room at some session or over time and just ask board members why they're there. Why did they agree to sure. be a board member? Right. And they can are, use their own voice to describe your own mission. Right. And then and then they'll say, yeah, well, so and so put the arm on me. You know, they asked me to join the board and, and you say to them, well, that's all we're asking you to do is what happened to you and you survived. Don't be apologetic. Right. I guess that, I, I, you know, that's 
take if you take that away from this, I think that's important. When you're trying to build a portfolio, you you have one responsibility. Well, you probably have many responsibilities, but being self-serving, thinking about philanthropy only, your one role is to bring resources into your organization that's deserving of that. And to do that, you need to create pipeline. You need people that are willing to write a check, leave an estate, do something. And the only way to get there is for you to qualify folks to do it. That's, uh, you, you, you are not selling widgets. You're selling something, uh, you know, important to your community and do not be apologetic to build pipeline. Don't, it, it's, you have no job if you don't do this. Well, that's for sure. And what you just that described, harsh? huh? Is that too harsh? I don't know. No, I, some tough love is important in our in this uh, business. Uh, uh, and, 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 but I would I would say that what Dave just described is the effect of institutional self-esteem. Right? So I call institutional self-esteem the notion of, well, gee, I mean, I mean, Abigus might say you can ask this person for a million dollars, you know, based on all the information. And you say, Well, how could our or our human service organization possibly ask someone? for a million dollars. There's your bias coming into play. Your bias is about your organization in the world against the world or your personal bias. And if the data is there, if the objectiveness is there, if the data says without any bias, objective free, bias free, that asking them for a million dollars is an appropriate ask. Right. Forget your institutional bias. Go get the biggest gift that your organization has ever gotten. And that's how you go do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, okay. Any recommendations when coming up against board members who already feel like they're doing so much by bringing their network into various events where they're giving minimally to support the trustees but have capacity to do much more? <laughs> Gee, never heard of that situation before. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. You know th that that person is probably on eight boards, right? You know, I, 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 there is no real answer. the The answer is, you know, dear Mister and Mrs. Board Member, where are we on your priorities? And you know, if if you're if we're really not one, two, or three. Oh my gosh, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the amazing things you've done. Figure out a way to put somebody in that role that were one, two, or three. Now that's that's easier said than done. I get that. That's Monday morning quarterbacking. But at the same time, if if a board member is feeling that either you're not listening to the board member, right? The board member is saying, Oh, I want to do this, and you're saying, Oh, well, you go out on a solicitation. Well, you can't fit the 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 round peg in the square box, right? You you got to give the board member what they're looking for. So I would first look at yourself and make sure that you're not, you know, are you doing what the board member wants, and then look at their, uh, you know, capacity to other organizations. I don't know, Larry. Well, but all of that, and tell the board member, listen, you're giving twenty five hundred dollars a year. You're introducing us to your wealthy peers, and we want to maximize that relationship. But with you giving at this level, that is suppressing the result of you giving us access to your network. So if we can elevate your thinking and your giving, then we can elevate their giving. You know, Laura, I don't know if if there's... Uh, a C-suite member, or if you're a consultant or anything like that, but you can always kind of put the, that kind of hard love on somebody else too, to, to kind of work with them. So it's, uh, you know, the relationship stays clean. Yes. Board chairs are really good for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And right. that way you're insulating your relationship so you can still work with them if it goes if it goes sideways. That's it. That's it. Right. You know, I, I don't think there's anybody from the organization. I so I chair a a, a school board and um I don't get asked enough, right? Like everybody know I don't mean asked enough like for my gift, 
they asked me enough that way. That's amazing. But like to, to work with alumni and go out and make out and they, this is what I do for a living. You would think that they would be all over it. Like you need to, um, don't be afraid to talk to your board members and, and let them say, oh my gosh, that's too, too crazy. I can't do that. Don't count them out. Uh, and, Especially and, the ones that are tuned in like you. Right, right. And anyone in sales, anyone who makes yeah. a living in sales, which most of us do in one, one fashion Absolutely. or another, right? uh, ought to get it. They ought to, they ought to understand it implicitly. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm grateful. Thank you, Larry, for uh, for letting me uh, pontificate a little bit on something that's well, important to me. Your wisdom is welcome always, Dick. Thank, thank you. you. And thank everyone uh, for joining us uh, very much. Uh, you'll all receive a video of this uh, tomorrow. Hopefully I'll get that to you. And um, again, if you have any questions, uh, contact me or Dave and um, go forth and may the force be with you all. All right. Peace, everyone. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Dave.